Hello there, I'm Kelsey Derringer, co-founder of CodeJoy. What you're about to watch is a 40-minute session in which we served about 30 participants, both students and teachers, joining us from all over the world, and we introduced them to both the Microbit as a tool and the Do Your Bit competition. The Do Your Bit Challenge is a global challenge hosted by the Microbit Foundation in which students aged 8 to 18 are encouraged to explore the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The session you're about to watch focuses on Global Goal 13, Climate Action. We built a shake table using the Strabi's Robotic Invention Kit, and during the session, students coded this uh, shake table here, and then we collected some data about how their earthquake simulations affected different building structures. Now, um, earthquakes are not directly linked to climate change. However, many of the factors that contribute to earthquakes are linked to humanity's influence on the Earth. Things like water and where it's located, and where humans choose to live and build things, as well as fossil fuel exploration and recovery. So we took sort of a unique approach to this session here in that we had students use the micro bit and the shake table to explore the problem that they could then turn into some solutions. So if you'd like to participate right along with us, I encourage you to open up this uh, bit.ly link, which will take you to a Google Doc. This Google Doc has all kinds of resources associated with this lesson, including tutorials for how to build your own shake table, data collection tables, and even some example code, so you can code right along with us. Do be sure to mind the um, capital letters as capitalization matters in bit.ly links. If you'd like some more information about how you can join the Do Your Bit Challenge, stay tuned after the session and we'll take you through the process. All right, let's explore some earthquakes with Microbit and Strabis. Everybody. Welcome. I am so glad you're here. My name is Kelsey. I was just hanging a picture over there, but I'm really excited that you all are joining us today for this webinar. Um, I'm here with Code Joy, as well as a couple other guests that I'll introduce you to shortly, but um, I'm really excited to learn a little bit about coding and robotics and earthquakes today as part of our Do Your Bit series of webinars. So we're going to learn about coding, robotics, earthquakes, and how you can use microbits to help out the world. Um, as always, I'm not here by myself. I am joined by my director and producer. He is a nine inch tall robot that lives under my kitchen sink, and his name is Matt the Robot. Hi, Matt the Robot. Hi, Kelsey. How are you today? I'm doing great. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, my favorite thing in the world to do is to uh, read chats, and there's a lot of chats coming in, so that makes me very, very happy. Uh, but I've got a question for all of you out there in chat world. I am wondering, what's the weather like where you are? Yeah, that's what, a great question. Yeah, what's the weather like where you are? Go ahead and type that into the chat, and I will bring it into the class. That's right, the chat is a great place to participate today. We'll ask you questions 
and you can give us answers. It's also a great place uh, for you to ask questions of us and our special guests. And um, we're also going to uh, show you how to code through our chat as well. So I'm in Pittsburgh. Today the weather is beautiful here. It's uh, sort of early morning, but it's, it's sunny, it's nice. But I have a couple guests here with me today as well. Um, please allow me to introduce Dr. Gabe Lotto. Gabe, do you want to tell people what you study and what the weather's like where you are? Hi, Kelsey. I study earthquakes and tsunamis, and that's all great, but right now it's dark and cloudy here in <laughs> Portland, Oregon. It's very early where you are, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> still still very dark. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us so early. And Lindsay, uh, do you want to tell folks what you do and what the weather's like where you are? Absolutely. So my name is Lindsay. I'm a teacher, educator, passionate about engineering, uh, teaching engineering and science. And the weather here in Sweden is kind of changing a lot. It's sometimes snowing, sometimes it's sunshine, it's a little cloudy. But lately I've been enjoying a nice sunny day with a little bit of snow. So it's very pleasant. Oh, that sounds very nice. I love that. Let's check out Matt the Robot here. And it looks like there are some students who uh, have told us what the weather is like where they are. So what are they saying, Matt? What's the weather like? That's right. Uh, for Swift, it is pitch black, which means it's either very early or very late. <laughs> Julie says that it is it is blustery where Julie is. Uh, let's see. It's dark out where Landon is. It is about 40 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny in Maureen's neck of the woods. <laughs> uh, it's sunny in Solomon's neck of the woods. Uh, gray in the sky and cold in southern Sweden. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. And then um, Lander asked me to relay a message to you, Gabe. Lander loves to study uh, tsunamis, tornadoes, and earthquakes, and just wanted you to know that. <laughs> Lander, we have a lot in common. That's great. That's great. All the way across the, across the way from each other, long distances apart, but connected by common interests, um, which is great because today we are going to be studying some earthquakes and um, learning some things about weather together, which is great. Oh, shoot. Sorry, I, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but there's a there are these robots that live behind my walls. This one's name is LB, and he's like always getting up to stuff. So let me let me check on him. I don't know what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> LB, what's going on, buddy? Oh no, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to cause an earthquake with my hammering. What can I do? What do you want to do? You know what? I think that's a great idea. I think it would be awesome to learn a little bit more about earthquakes, especially because my friend Dr. Gabe is here and he's an earthquake specialist. <laughs> How convenient. <laughs> um, so maybe a, a good place to start is with just like what is an earthquake and what causes an earthquake? Because I'm, I'm from the Midwest of, of the United States and we don't really have them there, so I've never experienced them. What makes an earthquake happen, Dr. Gabe? Well, that's a great question. So the earth is made up of these giant tectonic plates and they all are stuck together and pushing at each other. And most of the time they don't move at all because most of the time they're locked together. But every once in a while, stress builds up on these tectonic plates underground. And then all, the, all of a sudden the stress is released as an earthquake and the plates unzip from each other and cause shaking all around them. And that's when you feel an earthquake. Uh, that sounds kind of scary, actually. Uh, I know that earthquakes can get pretty bad. Like I said, I've never experienced one. I wonder if um, anybody in the, it can tell us in the chat, has anyone here ever experienced an earthquake before? I'd love to know. Um, but while you're telling us that, um, we're actually going to, uh, we wanna study earthquakes but I don't want to cause anymore, so I don't want to go around hammering my, my walls and upsetting my, my pals anymore. Um, so we're going to simulate an earthquake with this awesome tool right here. So this right here 
is the um, robotic invention kit from Strawbies, which allows you to use a, a micro bit. You can hook up different motors and things to it right here. And we've created a shake table. And Lindsay, since your team at Strawbies was responsible for designing this shake table, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how it works. Absolutely. So uh, the shake table is built with a very short cube and it's made of straws and Strawbies connectors. That is, uh, so this cube is uh, sandwiched between two pieces of cardboard. So Kelsey is doing a wonderful job hand modeling the, the shake table so we can explore all different corners of it. The cardboard sheets represent the Earth's tectonic plates and the flexible wiggly structure of the cube allows us to simulate the shifting tectonic plates. So connected to these sheets are basically a series of levers levers, um, levers, levers, uh, with moving joints that are pushed and pulled by the servo motor that Kelsey is currently demonstrating. And this servo motor is attached to the, the bottom uh, cardboard piece that is controlled by the micro bit. And these levers are connected to cross beams, which is under the top plate, which are simulating the earthquake movement with code. There we go. That, uh, uh, I think this little design is just so ingenious because you're using the wiggliness of the straws. And if I turn this on, you can take a look at it. Check this out. As this motor moves down here, it's moving our shake table back and forth. So this is what we're going to use to simulate an earthquake today, which is pretty cool. I'm gonna turn this back off. And um, I'd love to hear uh, I, I'm going to read off some of the, uh, the things that um, students have experienced with earthquakes. Um, looks like there were a couple students who uh, uh, saw that, uh, or who experienced an earthquake when they were uh, a baby. Are there any other students who've experienced earthquakes, Matt? <laughs> yeah, uh, so Solomon was a student that experienced the oh. earthquake uh, when, when he was a baby. Uh, Jennifer experienced one while uh, she was on a walk in New Jersey, but she didn't even feel it. Uh, let's see. I think there were a couple more. Yes, Carl experienced one in southern Sweden once, uh, and it was caused by internal vibrations in the tectonic plates. Yeah, those are, those are the only earthquake responses I'm getting right now. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, I'm really excited to um, investigate these and kind of see them in action a little bit. So we've got our earthquake table down there with LB. Let me, um, uh, let me fix this up a little bit, make this look a little nicer. Let me reach in here. Let's, uh, let's change up the scenery a little bit. Yeah, nice. Quack. All right. Wonderful. And that's our little test dummy named Quack. Hi, Quack. You guys can say hi to Quack. But uh, let's investigate how this is working because we want you to help us code different earthquakes and investigate how they affect building structures. And we're actually going to share this code with you in the chat. All right, so we're going to uh, we're going to share this code with you in the chat. So if you click on that link, Matt just shared it, you can open this up. And let me show you what to do once you once you click on that link. It won't look quite like mine to start out with. It'll look like this, and you can't change anything around. But to open it up and look inside and actually adjust the code, you just click Edit Code on the top, like so. Um, and uh, then you can see this, this code that's actually running on our robot right now. So our, our motor is moving back and forth from 40% to 80%. What does that mean? Well, I've got a little demonstration here, a little visual to show us. So it's going from, uh, uh, this, this uh, motor can go from zero degrees to hypothetically 180, but it really only makes it to about 120 or so, because we're using a very small micro servo motor. And so uh, you could think about it as a, a halfway arc, though. And you could think about each of these points along the way as a percentage of its possible movement. So all the way to one side is 0%. All the way to its full range of motion is 100%. 50% would be in the middle, etc. So this code here that is um, going from 40% to 80%, well, that just means it's going from like, you know, 40 would be like here and like 80 would be like here. So it's wiggling back and forth from there to there, and I'll show you that side by side again, 40% to 80%. But then that pause is also doing something. That pause is telling it how fast to move back and forth between those two angles. 
So the pause right now is at 500 milliseconds. Now there are a thousand milliseconds in one second. 1,000 to one, all right? So 500 milliseconds is a half a second. And you can see that right here, right? It's moving back and forth, just a, a half a second pause in between, great. But we want you to change that up and to do something else with it. So we want you to change this code, change these numbers around. The biggest number is 180 for the percentage. The sm actually, the biggest number is 100 for the percentage. The smallest number is zero. And you can put whatever pauses you want in there. We're going to investigate what those look like. And when you want to send them to us, everybody come back and join us back here on Zoom for a second because I want to show you how to share your code back with us. Up at the top, there's this little button. It's got three dots connected by two lines here. And uh, you can click share. And then give this a title. You might put your name on there, like I would put Kelsey. That way we know whose it is. So be sure to put your name in your title. Publish it. And then it gives you this link, which you can copy and paste for us back in the chat. So go ahead and do that. Change some numbers. Click share. Put your name in there. Publish, copy, and paste it in the chat. And that's how we will see the earthquake that you simulate. But we actually want to investigate not only um, how are they going to affect quack, but uh, the quack would be like a person walking on the street, right? But also we want to know how are they going to affect buildings? Because we spend a lot of our lives inside, right? So let's take a look at how uh, our, our original earthquake, how would our original earthquake affect um, a small short building? Let's take a look at this. Now we're going to put 30 seconds on our timer here. And Dr. Gabe, um, is 30 seconds a good amount of time for an earthquake? Great question. Earthquakes can be small earthquakes, they can be big earthquakes. If you're in a small earthquake, it could last only a couple of seconds. If you're in a big earthquake, it could last even up to minutes long. So 30 seconds is a great time to test if your building can withstand the shaking. That is great to know. It looks like this little one-story building here stood the test of 30 seconds of time, <laughs> which is great. So that first code we sent you, that's what happens with that. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, I kind of want to watch stuff fall over today. That's, that's one of my goals, <laughs> personal goals. Let's check and see what a, a taller building, this one would be is twice as tall as the old one, uh, as the first one. Let's see what happens to this one when we shake it. That same, that same one. Oh gosh, uh, quack uh, did not last long. <laughs> that's uh, that's a bummer. Uh, I do like watching stuff all over though. Um, but uh, so that's what we're going to do to test your code as well. We're going to test it out and see how it affects quack when quack is on structure number one which is our short building, and then structure number two, which is our tall building. And we're actually going to make some observations as we go here too. Um, so you can see here, we've got some math that we filled in here to describe our control test, uh, to describe the earthquake that we've created. And we're gonna come back and explore this a little bit more in a bit. Um, but right now we can fill in some observations about what happened to our short structure and what happened to our tall structure. So for the short structure, after 30 seconds, quack and the building stayed uh, and for the tall building, after just three seconds, quack, and the building fell. <laughs> Both of those fell down. So this is some math to describe our my code, but I'd love to take a look at some students' code. Matt, do you have some students' code up? Yeah, I have some code up by Lander. All right, let's take a look at Lander's code. So first things first, um, what are you thinking about this code, Lindsay? What, uh, do you have any reactions to it? Yes, I think that it'll cause a major devastation for quack. Okay, <laughs> let's let's see it. And when we when we see it, um, Dr. Gabe, maybe you can give us some. Oh, there it is. And I'll start our timer here. Let's see how he stands up to it. Does this remind you of any kind of an earthquake that you've seen before, Dr. Gabe? Well, the first earthquake we saw was a pretty mild one. Okay. Maybe. Uh, 
maybe you want to call that a magnitude five. And, and this one's a little bit bigger. Uh, you'd see the ground shaking a lot more. We'll, we'll talk about what that means. Oh, and there he goes. There he goes. Yep. <laughs> call this a magnitude seven earthquake. How about that? Looks like we had about uh, about five seconds left on our timer then. So I'm gonna make a quick observation, Lander. Structure number one, it lasted 25 seconds. And quack fell off, but the structure didn't fall. So quack, fell, structure, good. Just kind of making some, some journal observations here. After 25 seconds, quack fell, but the structure was good. But so you were thinking that one was like a magnitude five earthquake, you were thinking? Well, I think that one was even bigger oh. than your test earthquake. Gotcha, nice. Uh, so our test earthquake was smaller because that it, the motor wasn't moving as much, but now that the motor's moving bigger, uh, we'll try it out. All right, so we're gonna test out the two-story structure on Lander's code. Are you ready? All right. Three, two, one. Oh man, <laughs> it fell right away. It fell right over Quack. Quack. Zero seconds. <laughs> zero seconds on that one, Lander. So making an observation, zero seconds, all things fell down. <laughs> That's great. All right. So um, I have some other numbers in here though, some other things that we can kind of calculate as we go. And we, we have a quick, uh, I'll show you some of these angles that are, or some of these words that are in here. We've got a word like amplitude, period, frequency. Can we bring up a little, um, a little visual to show what amplitude, period, frequency are? And can you, you explain what those are, Gabe? Yeah, so when we saw that shake table, it went back and forth and back and forth. And you can imagine that as a kind of wave. And so what this blue lion looks like is, is a wave that we might record as an earthquake scientist on a seismometer. And so you can see that the wave can be different heights and it could be different widths. So do you want to talk about the heights first? Sure. That word amplitude, because I'm, I'm starting to fill out my table here. And so uh, uh, Lander had put 100 and 0 in there. So that means that the difference between the angles was 100. And the amplitude is that divided by 2. Can we go back to that visual? What, what, is, what is that amplitude measuring? Well, if, that, if you see that line in the middle, that dot, the dashed line, mm -hmm. that, if the earthquake looked like that, it wouldn't be an earthquake at all. The ground would be totally still. So as the further away you go from that dashed line in the middle, the stronger the earthquake and the bigger the amplitude. Nice. All right, so the bigger amplitude, that means uh, the ground is moving more, right? That's right. And in okay. this case, our shake table is moving back and forth further. So Lander had a bigger amplitude than my original code. That's right. So what about this one here? What is the period... Uh, and what is the frequency? What do those mean? And we can go back to that visual again. Yeah, you can see that each of these waves, uh, in order to be a wave, it has to start at the middle, go out to the side, come back to the middle again, and then go to the other side. And all of that takes some amount of time. It doesn't happen instantly, right? It's going back and forth, back and forth. And so the period is the measure of how long it takes for the wave to go all the way to one side, all the way to the other side, and back to the middle. If I were gonna demonstrate this with our classic sort of like slinky situation, so uh, an ampli the amplitude is how much it's moving back and forth. All right, so it'd be a big amplitude. Now, the frequency is how fast my hand is moving. So like here's a small amplitude, high frequency. Small amplitude, high frequency. Here's a big amplitude, big frequency. Here's a small amplitude, low frequency. It's my hand is moving slower and it's not going very far. Here's big amplitude, small frequency. Big and slow, right? So you can think of this line in between my wood grains as that like midpoint that it's moving around, right? If you have a slinky at home, I highly recommend playing with it all the time and also investigating earthquakes with it. <laughs> and Kelsey, I don't want to interrupt, but no, we please. had a question in the chat from mm -hmm. Solomon. Solomon was wondering, why are there tectonic plates? That is a great question, Solomon. I'm going to send that over to Gabe. <laughs> why are there tectonic plates? 
It really is a great question, Solomon. <laughs> Underneath the, the surface of the earth, everything's really hot. It's called the mantle. And in the mantle, there, it's, it, all of the material is hot. It's about, imagine molten rock, almost liquid. And that liquid rock kind of swirls around and comes up. And it comes up in these plumes, these plumes that want to come up to the surface. But on the surface of the earth, it's cooler there. Right, we're on the on the edge of the planet, and it's cool enough to solidify and harden. And so you have a balance between this hot molten mantle and the cool crust. And the mantle wants to push the crust to the side and make new crust. And tectonic plates are just what happens uh, when you want to move these solid objects against each other. They find places where they're weaker, and they that's where those fault lines are. That's where the plate boundaries are. Nice. That is such a good, uh, so the, those tectonic plates are like uh, thing, uh, where things move and sort of the reason is that the stuff that's happening underneath it has kind of broken it. That's cool. It's like the crust of a pie. Nice. And it was just pie day recently, so there we go. It's on all of our minds, I know. Um, to, to finish out our work here, um, we are going to fill in next the period. This is how long it takes for a wave to pass by. So we can just add up the pause blocks. So Lander had put 500 and 500 in there. Uh, so that leads us to 1,000 milliseconds. We want this to appear in seconds. So we just move our decimal back and we get one second. The frequency uh, talks about how many waves happen in a second. So you take one second divided by your period, which in our case is one again, so we get one hertz. So in this case, our frequency and our period are the same as each other, and uh, they're the same as our first wave as well, but you'll notice the amplitude is different. So the amplitude of Lander's wave was bigger, that means that it moved more, and you can see the outcomes for our buildings here. So in just 25 seconds, quack fell off, and in just zero seconds, both quack and the building fell over. So just by changing the amplitude, we changed the outcome of this earthquake. Uh, Matt, do we have another code to take a look at? Uh, this one belongs to Rasmus. All right, Rasmus. And while you're resetting that, Kelsey, uh, there's another question. This one is from Sam and Isaac. They're wondering, what was the worst uh, earthquake recorded in history? Well, I can tell you the biggest one, the biggest earthquake ever recorded was way back in 1960. And that was in Chile. Uh, that was a 9.5 earthquake. And we've never seen an earthquake bigger than that. But we only started recording earthquakes uh, in the last hundred years or so. And so there were probably really big earthquakes before that. And there probably will be big earthquakes in the future too. Man, uh, well, maybe uh, I certainly have some questions about what to do <laughs> during an earthquake now that you said that they're gonna happen again. Uh, we could have probably guessed that, but I'm definitely curious. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a second. I wonder if anybody else is curious too. Um, so this one is Rasmus's code. And whenever you're ready, let's download it. Downloading Rasmus's code right now. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> Whoa. Nice, Rasmus. That was great. So it's about. Uh, I, I got about five, 23 seconds, is 23 what, I, seconds? what I recorded. All right, so after about seven seconds, both Quack and the building fell. And they actually fell off the side, so I'm going to note that here. And you'll notice I also have some other numbers filled in, and this is based on Rasmus's code. So let's take a look at that. Lindsay, what are you thinking about this code? What do you notice about it? So it looks like that the position is fairly similar to the previous one that we saw setting between, I think, 30 and 80. Mm -hmm. Is it 80? And what I thought was interesting about this one was that the building slowly slid off, kind of like a shimmy to the, to the, to the, well, I guess on my side, the right, <laughs> yeah. which is kind of interesting. It's like big motion, but slow shimmy. So it wasn't, because it wasn't connected to the plate, mm -hmm. it just allowed it to slowly slide off until it met its destruction. Yeah. 
Uh, what do you notice about the pause blocks? Because I'm noticing something that's different from what we've seen so far. Yeah, the pause uh, are different. One is 500 milliseconds and the other one is 200 milliseconds. So that actually is very interesting. So what it's, and what it's doing there means that since the pauses aren't equal, that means it's staying at one position longer than it's staying at the other one for, right? One is, it's, it's doing that little uh, pattern, right? That's correct. Yeah, so it's, it's moving a little bit differently there. So let's check in on our math here to describe the earthquake that Rasmus created. So here are the two angles that they put in. So 80 and 30, the difference between those is gonna be 50. Our amplitude is that difference divided by two. So our amplitude is gonna be 25. You can see how that compares to our other two earthquakes. And then the period is the sum of those pause blocks. So in this case, they were different numbers, but the period is still how long it takes to go by. So 500 milliseconds plus 200 milliseconds, that gets us 700 milliseconds. And if we move our decimal point back, our period, is 0.7 seconds, so that's how long it takes for a wave to move through. Our frequency is one divided by our period there, so one divided by 0.7. Hey Matt, you're a robot, what's, uh, what's one divided by 0.7? That's going to be 1.4285, uh, we'll say 1.4. Okay, great, 1.4 hertz. That is how many waves move through this in a second. So since it takes less than a second, more than one wave goes through in a second, which is great. So you can see how our frequency has changed, our amplitude has changed, and uh, this is a totally different earthquake you've created, Rasmus. Then uh, I think there were some other questions in our chat too. Um, somebody was wondering, Dr. Gabe, are there earthquakes in Germany? There are sometimes earthquakes, but they're very rare and they're probably gonna be pretty small. So you probably don't have to worry too much if you're in Germany. Okay, that's good. I'm not in Germany, but I'm glad that my German friends are safe, which is great. Me too. Um, so I have a question for you too. For anybody who lives in a place where there are earthquakes sometimes, um, what should you do when there's an earthquake? I did tornado drills as a kid, because I grew up in Iowa, but what should we do if there's an earthquake? If you feel shaking in an earthquake, it's really simple what you do. You want to drop, cover, and hold on. So you want to get low to the ground in a safe way. You want to cover your head and neck, and you want to hold on to something sturdy. So you want to maybe be under a strong table or a desk. You want to grab onto the leg and hold on. You want to stay there until the shaking stops. And if you're in a different situation, if you're driving in your car, uh, you just want to stop and slow down and pull over to the side of the road. If you're already in bed, maybe if you're sleeping, because earthquakes can happen overnight too while we're asleep. In bed, just stay in bed, cover, take your pillow, put it over your head, hold on to the bedpost. So really you just want to ride it out. And don't try to run around, don't try to run outside of your building. And I think we've got a great example of students doing that in Alaska. So I'd like to show you this video real quick. And just so you know, everyone's okay in this video. It's like a minute long and everybody's okay and they do exactly what they're supposed to do during an earthquake. So check out how real students reacted to a real earthquake. Don't let yourself be convinced to do something that you know is bad. And then Ian, finally Wow. Solomon said it, uh, said it well in the chat. Solomon said that was a serious earthquake. Totally. Can you tell just by looking what, how, how severe that was? Do you think that was a 1.0? Do you think it was a 6.0? What did, do you, can you tell just by looking? 
Uh, it's a good question. You can't really tell by looking because the earthquake magnitude is a, imagine like a, a light bulb. A light bulb is a certain brightness. But if you're in the other corner in the room, it's going to appear much dimmer. So at an individual level, we measure earthquake intensity. And so that's what it feels like to be an earthquake. And that was kind of a moderate shaking. It looked like uh, it could get, it could actually get worse than that. But everyone, everyone in that video responded just the right way. Everyone dropped, covered, and held on to their desk. And everyone was okay. I think the, the teacher was really brave too. The teacher was just like, okay, we're doing it. He checked to make sure all the students were safe. He was like, all right, cover your mouth with your, your shirt. So if there's dust, you're not breathing it in. Somebody was on the PA immediately. That school handled that so well. And, and uh, someone commented in the chat that those students were really brave and composed, totally. Um, so we've seen a, a real earthquake, but let's bring it back into the fun and sort of silly place where we are today, which is let's put um, Rasmus's earthquake to the test on Quack. All right, we'll head over here. Let's download Rasmus's code. Oh no, man, it's so close. <laughs> it's so close. <laughs> I, I feel like building I, number two. I have to say Rasmus is maybe the most destructive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, I think this is a, uh, an instructional design problem you and know. not a seismic problem. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what we built our structures out of is just some note cards. We put some pipe cleaners through straws. We thought we'd stick with the straw theme. And these, uh, these pipe cleaners, uh, we just taped to the note card, which props to... Um, uh, Museum of Science Boston, we got the idea from a curriculum from years ago from them, which is pretty cool. Um, so this was our, our structure. If you want to do this activity at home, maybe you can think of some ways to improve this and make it a little more quack resistant <laughs> or quack supportive. Um, but I, I can't believe it, everybody. I'm looking at the time. I think we've just about come to the end of our time, which brings me to my favorite part of all of our shows. Uh, which is where we get to turn to all of you who have participated with us today and say thank you. Thank you to all of you for being with us today. We can't do these sessions and we can't do this learning without all of you. So to the teachers and the students tuning in from all over the world, thank you so much for being with us today. Matt, what were some of your favorite parts of today's session? Well, as you know, I really like to read chats, so I really want to thank Peter and Solomon for being so active in the chat, asking so many wonderful questions. Thank you. Absolutely. And to our featured coders, Lander and Aparna and Rasmus, great coding today, you, you guys. Plus, everybody who submitted code that we didn't get to see, thank you guys as well for submitting some code today. Now, stick around afterwards, um, and we are going to talk a little bit more about that Do Your Bit challenge and teach you how to submit your own ideas. Now, if you want to check out some more CodeJoy classes, you can find us on our website here and maybe join a future Do Your Bit session for free as well. Um, plus, be sure to find us on Twitter. We'd love for you to tag us, tell us how we did, how you enjoyed our session, or what we could do for next time. Uh, also, check out Strawbees and the Microbit Foundation. They're always up to some cool and great things. Thank you so much for joining us today, everybody. Keep coding. See you next time. Hey there, welcome back. Let's talk a little bit more about that Do Your Bit challenge. I first want to make sure that you've got this link here to open up a Google Doc. Let me show you what's on that Google Doc here. Uh, this Google Doc has all kinds of great resources where you can like learn more about CodeJoy, you can learn more about Strawbees and the Microbit. Um, this recording will be available here as well. Plus, it's got links for you to do things like uh, access a tutorial that'll teach you how to build your own shake table. Um, it's got some example code here in Make Code so that you can open that right up and code along with us. Um, plus, uh, down at the bottom, it's also got a table where if your students do this activity, you could print this off and have them use this to collect their own data. Plus, it's got lots of information about the Do Your Bit Challenge. Let's focus on that. 
So the Do Your Bit Challenge uh, is an annual challenge focusing on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This year, 2021, they're focusing on Global Goal 3, Good Health and Well-Being, and 13, Climate Action. You can learn more about that on their website there. Uh, but when you're ready to submit your ideas, you just go to Enter the Challenge, where it's got some sort of top-level, high-level, uh, what do you need in order to enter this challenge? Well, first of all, you've got to be between the ages of 8 and 18. Uh, you can enter by yourself or in a group of up to three students. And when you're ready to submit your idea, well, here's what you need. Uh, three things. First, a description of the problem and your solution and how you're using your microbit. Second, either a paper prototype, aka a drawing, uh, or a hex file, which is the type of file you create when you code in MakeCode. And then optionally, number, number three, uh, you can also submit a picture or a video of your solution in action. So when you've got all those things collected, you just click Enter Now, and it takes you to a form that you'll submit. Uh, you can submit more than one idea, and the submissions are open through the end of July 2021. So we hope that you enjoyed this session, and we hope you're inspired to go create some solutions to those global sustainable development goals with your microbit. Thanks.